Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Arlene Dunn. I'm curating the um, Kendall at Oberlin Racial Equity Forum series. And tonight, it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend, Jeff Scott. Uh, Jeff, a native of Queens, New York, started the French Horde at age 14, receiving an anonymous gift scholarship to begin his private study and formal introduction to music theory at the Brooklyn College Preparatory. An even greater gift came from his first private teacher, Carolyn Clark, who taught the young Mr. Scott for free during his high school years, giving him the opportunity to study music when resources were not available. Since receiving degrees from Manhattan School of Music in 1990 and State University of New York at Stony Brook in 1992, Jeff has enjoyed a career as a studio, chamber, and orchestral musician, performing in Broadway shows, ballet companies, touring with various commercial artists, as well as recording for film, classical music, pop music, and jazz music. Mr. Scott's composing credits include original works for symphonic and chamber orchestra, chorus, chamber ensembles, and solo works for winds, brass, strings, and voice. In 2021, Mr. Scott, a founding member of the acclaimed quintet Imani Winds, retired after 24 groundbreaking years of touring, recording, and pedagogy. The quintet was honored with a permanent installation at the Smithsonian Museum of African American History in 2017. Jeff is the Associate Professor of Horn at Oberlin College and Conservatory. Let's give Jeff a warm Kendall welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you, Arlene. And thank you, Larry. I know you're out there somewhere. Um, uh, thank you very much for their friends of mine. And so I feel like I'm being invited to their home with their friends. And, um, and I, I feel welcome already. Thank you so much. I also should acknowledge that I have some colleagues in the audience, uh, Florence Gill and Ross Carre, professors at Oberlin College, and our dean of, of the conservatory, Bill Quillen. So. <laughs> Um, what I'd love to do today is um, share with you some thoughts that I have about music, music theory, um, and race relations as it comes as it pertains to music. But I also would love to have um, time in the end to talk with you. Um, and so I'm going to do everything in my power, and Arlene is going to help me <laughs> in this regard to not talk too much so that we can interact, because I think that... Um, what I'm offering is less uh, a lecture um, and more just sort of sharing ideas and thoughts. And I feel like I could probably learn from you as well. So um, I'm going to get started um, by really just sort of talking about generally what I'm going to cover. So my talk will be about control. Who has it? And the decades long argument on how it can be shared. More intimately, my talk is about the established American social construct and what happens when it's threatened. It's about higher education music institutions and what they consider classical music study. It's about music theory and who gets to decide what the theoretical focus is for a curriculum. And finally, it's about autonomy, not only for people of other races and cultures, but for students of music. Before I get into all of that, I want to talk about baseball. <laughs> I know, that was really heavy stuff. And I want to talk about baseball because I, as a young person, um, I had really three desires of what I'd love to do in, in life. One of them was to be like Michael Jackson. I didn't know how I was going to do that on horn, but I, I figured I was going to figure that out later. I wanted to be a cartoonist. I did a lot of cartooning, much to the chagrin 
of my first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade teachers <laughs> as I would pass all of those cartoons around, putting all of them, those teachers in compromising situations. <laughs> and I also wanted to be a baseball player. And the main reason why I wanted to be a baseball player was because in 1977, uh, I lived in a building in Queens, New York, and I looked out into the schoolyard. We had just moved to this building, by the way. I looked out into the schoolyard, and the kids were playing baseball. And to that point, I was 10 years old. I had never played ball. I had never seen anyone playing baseball. And I was a little shy to go and run out and play, so I waited till they ended the game, and I knew one of the guys playing because he lived in the building. And his name was Michael, Michael Hurd. I'll never forget. And I said, Michael, when it was all over, could you show me how to play baseball? He's like, you don't know how to play baseball? I'm like, no. He says, all right. And he showed me how to play baseball and so on. And as he was throwing the ball to me, I was really, I was really good at hitting the ball. I just all of a sudden had the great, you need to have hand-eye coordination. And he said to me at the end of that half hour training session. He said, you keep that up, you're going to be just like Reggie Jackson. I had no idea who Reggie Jackson was. <laughs> but it was 1977. And if you're a baseball fan, you know that the Yankees are just about to win the World Series. This was September, by the way. So, of course, I, you know, mom, you know, who's Reggie Jackson? Oh, you're, you're the Yankees and so on. And so I go and I watch. And I watch this amazing, talented, African-American man with an afro this big, and if you'd know him, an attitude way bigger than that, <laughs> just being himself, just doing what he does best, and being admired for it. And I wanted to be like that. I, I saw it, and I knew I could do something like that because I saw it right there. He looked like me. Fast forward. I didn't become a baseball player, mainly because I had a bum leg. <laughs> and I also didn't have the greatest arm. Like, I, you know, the guys were really throwing the ball well, and I didn't have, but I had a bum leg. And art, quick story, I actually auditioned at art schools in New York City when I got out of high school. And we had to do a still life drawing. So a woman came on, she sat on this table, she had on like this Roman outfit, and we all sat around the table, we had to sketch her, and the proctor said, do it in your own vision. Well, I was into comic book heroes, and super, you know, man, and Spider-Man, and so I drew her with muscles and gashes, and she was this gorgeous blonde with, you know, curves, and uh, she looked like that. And so the proctor made her way around the table, and when she got behind me, all she said was, <laughs> and she walked away. <laughs> I didn't get in. <laughs> so I told my mom, we're down to, we're down to music, mom. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I got into Manhattan School of Music, but a hope and a prayer. <laughs> but um, I think it worked out all right for me. But... I spent the first couple of years in my music study sort of still searching for that vision of myself. Um, when I got to Manhattan School of Music, there were literally four other people of color. And I remember we all found each other within the first week and sat at the same table together. And whenever we saw each other, you know. Um, of course, those numbers have improved. But just the idea of seeing yourself on the stage seeing your vision replicated on the stage, seeing a version of yourself doing well in this field, that's not the most commonplace thing. And it's important. It's really important for young people to see that. So baseball, indeed, is an amazing sport. It's not perfect, but almost. I'm one of those fans that gets into the little details. In fact, in my Oberlin interview, I told them that whole story that I just told you. In fact, they said, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? And I said, well, you know, I, I never wanted to be a French horn player. <laughs> I want to play for the New York Yankees. And they just cracked them up because, you know, what are you talking about baseball here? 
But if not for Branch Rickey, the owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers, and Jackie Robinson, I probably would not be a fan of baseball. Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier. Branch Rickey helped him do it. But the truth, if you know the history of baseball, is that baseball was already anticipating the integration of blacks in sports. And Branch Rickey, that owner, while a political activist, was a businessman. And he saw the opportunity in being the first owner to break the color line. As long as they had the right black player to do it with. As long as they could control the narrative. As long as the social construct could be eased into acceptance. Almost like a local orchestra programming a Florence Price symphony for a season. The change was difficult because it challenged our social construct. But we did it. Now I say all these praises about baseball and I talk about all of the advances, but I say that recognizing one thing. There are no women in baseball. We got a ways to go, would you say? The American social construct was never meant to include people of color. Neither the people nor their opinions. Not socially, not politically, and definitely not culturally. And if we are to be completely honest, when it comes to opinions, white women were not meant to have equal voice or a seat at the table. And throughout history, whenever the control of the construct was threatened, it was met with huge resistance. The entities themselves were systematically dismantled, usually done politically, but often by brute force. Things could have been different. In recent years, I've studied much about classical music history in the United States, and while there is much to know, it is clear to me our nation had two momentous opportunities to recognize and capitalize on the contributions of our diverse population. In the early 18th century, while the Moravians were busy doing missionary work, teaching the indigenous people of the Carolinas and Virginias how to play amateur violin, how to play church hymns on piano, and creating small amateur society, music societies. In New Orleans, there was a thriving and diverse arts culture, one with orchestras, composers, opera houses, all with people of color. I'll say that again. In New Orleans, in the early 18th century, there was a thriving and diverse arts culture with orchestras, composers, opera houses, all with people of color. Trained and learned musicians, artists, craftsmen, all of African descent. These Africans came to the Americas in the service of European aristocrats and had the status of freed men of color. This status remained for many, many years up until the Civil War. New Orleans at this time was known for its slave ship ports and proximity to the Caribbean islands, making it a cultural and financial hub. New Orleans was colonized by Spain and France, and in all actuality had more in common with the Caribbean 
than it had with any of the interior states of this newly forming nation. They had their own laws. For example, a slave could demand freedom if he could pay for it. If a slave was in service of a European aristocrat and the aristocrat died, he or she was automatically granted freedman status. Also, their influence on music, especially classical music, was substantial. For example, raise your hand if you know the dance form Saraband. Of course, yes. And we know it from the classical sense, especially from the Baroque era. Well, Saraband comes from, originally, Sarabanda, the Congo god of iron and war. That's right. This thought of a style, which, you know, Saraband is a style, it's a rhythm, it's a pattern, came from Africa. Traveled from Africa to the New World, to the Americas, mixed around in New Orleans and the Caribbean with all the aristocrats and all the great composers that were coming through there, went back to Europe. And then you have what we know today as the Saraband Dance. The influence was substantial. Fast forward. The Civil War happened. And all freed men of color lost their freed man status. Their right to study and ability to create and share art. Our first failed opportunity. All the while, the eastern coastal states were creating amateur orchestras and schools of music based on the European pedagogy model. There was a desire to create a nationwide European-based conservatory system. Many schools tried to do this at the end of the 19th century. A lot failed. They all tried to use the basic model from Paris. In, sorry, in 1892, Antonin Dvorak came to New York as the appointed director of the newly formed National Conservatory of Music. It was America's first official music conservatory. During his tenure, he befriended a student, a vocalist and composer by the name of Henry Burley who would invite Antonin to church sermons. By the way, Henry was African-American, sorry. <laughs> he would invite Antonin to church sermons where hymns and call response gospel songs were sung. The influence on Dvorak was clear. His famous symphony of the New World was composed during the tenure that he had at that school. Primarily from that relationship that he had with Henry but also in his travels and his hearings of musics of the New World. There's a famous Harper's Magazine article where Dvorak basically scolded American composers for not embracing the music of their native country, saying, and I quote, I know that it is still an open question whether the inspiration derived from a few scattered melodies and folk songs can be sufficient to give a national character to higher forms of music. Just as it is an open question whether national music, as such, is preferable. I myself, as I have always declared, believe firmly that the music that is most characteristic of the nation, whence it springs, is entitled to the highest consideration. The part of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony that appeals most strongly to all is the melody of the last movement, and that is also the most German. Weber's best opera, according to the popular estimate, is Der Freischutz. Why? 
because it is the most German. His inspiration there clearly came from the thoroughly German sounds and situations of the story, and hence his music assumed that distinctly national character which has endeared it to the German nation as a whole. Yet he himself spent far more pains on his opera, Urantha, and persisted to the end in regarding it as his best work. But the people we see claim their own. And after all, it is for the people that we strive. Unquote. I wonder if in history we started very young in telling the truth about the history of classical music with our young folks, if, if it would make a difference. I wonder. I also wonder if it would be illegal to do it down in Florida. <laughs> I believe it would be too woke. Right? Right? This was our second opportunity to look at the diversity of our nation and embrace the contributions from the people of color along with, along with the European canon, and it failed. In fact, the constituency that read this article ignored him. There are scathing response articles basically asking why high art should consider the music of the uneducated descendants of slaves or the maid. I, I had a recent debate with a colleague um, just about a week ago, in fact, about what we as professors of classical music are, are actually doing. Um, he said something really interesting to me. He said, we don't have schools of music. We have schools of Western or European music. Otherwise, we would study music from all nations, or at least offer the courses of study. The construct is designed to build a curriculum around basically 12 European composers and the theory and analysis of their compositions. Now, I've gotten to a lot of trouble with what I'm about to say, and my dean's here, and I'm not tenured yet. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Bill. <laughs> Uh, but I've not said this in um, much in, in, in public, but I've definitely said it in quarters of people that, um, that matter. Um, and it's that, in, and this is really my firm belief. I, I, I stand behind this. No one told me this. I feel sometimes like we're running a Ponzi scheme. A Ponzi scheme. Because... About a year ago, um, I was doing a Zoom lecture, something, something like this, and we were all talking about, you know, the fact that things were going to open up, you know, now that the COVID was, was done and, you know, opportunities were going to come back and students were going to be able to go back to auditioning for orchestras and, you know, things were going to change. And I know of a website called Musical Chairs. Musical Chairs list all the available jobs that there are out, out there in any given orchestra for any given instrument at the time. And it also has like where you need to go, the pieces you need to play, and so forth. At that time, there were exactly seven jobs available in the United States for French horn. I have eight students in my studio right now. What am I selling them? If I tell my students, if they learn how to play Beethoven 7, how to play Brahms 1, 
and the exposition of some Mozart concerto that in four years you'll be just fine, you'll get a job. What am I really telling them? I'm not telling the truth. And so if I don't teach them something else, I'm doing a horrible service to them. It's a Ponzi scheme. And I say it's a Ponzi scheme because then they go on to teach and they do the same thing. They don't get jobs in the field. They get frustrated. They work in different lines of work, and they say, you know, maybe I'll go back and I'll teach. And then they do the same thing for their students. And sometimes it's worse because they don't get college jobs. They do it to the younger kids. And they tell them, oh, you'll be just fine. You'll get a job in an orchestra. Don't worry. It's not true. It's not true. We have to prepare our students for more. But the thing is this. Are our institutions preparing our students for more? Are our institutions that feed the other, the, the musical institutions, are they prepared for more? Those are the questions. Now, I don't have the answers. I know the answer, but I don't know how to fix it exactly. <laughs> I have ideas. I have ideas. In a recent study, and this is one of the ideas, by the way, in a recent study, it was found that 94% of all tenured music faculty in the United States are Caucasian. 94% of all tenured music faculty are Caucasian. The people who make the decisions on what curriculum should be, what theory should be, who should attend, it's not diverse enough. And so if we're ever going to broaden the lens of what we're teaching, you have to have more ideas at the table. People with diverse ideas. Contrary ideas. Ideas that make you upset. It has to be that way. There are too many lives at stake. And every year they pass through and we give them a certificate and we say, go with God. Get that job. What job? And it's our fault. It's not their fault. It's our fault. We've told them this from the very beginning. We told them from the very beginning when they were eight years old, seven years old, if you practice hard, you'll get that job. And then we teach them Mozart and Beethoven. We tell them that's all there is for music. That's, if you learn this, if you learn this, you'll be just fine. And it neglects everything that this soil is about. There's a music here that's our very own music. It came hard to get. It comes from the roots and the soil and the blood of a horrible history. But for God's sakes, it's ours, and we all enjoy it. Why can't we teach it? What's stopping us from admitting the fact that it's ours and we can't just teach it? Part of it is fear. Part of it is fear. And it's because there are people who have spent their lives studying how to teach in a European pedagogical form. And when you start messing with the construct, you're messing with their pocket their livelihood, everything that they built. And they become irrelevant, partly. So to make the change, people are going to get hurt. Heck, I might. <laughs> you know? You don't need a specific person to do one thing. Maybe you need somebody that has a few more trades up their sleeve. But it can't remain the same way. We can't continue to teach these people, these young people, that if you do this one particular thing and study these, these 10, 12 composers, that you're going to have a great career. Some will, and we know that. We go and we hear the great ones. Not everybody's going to be Yu Zha Wang. No, it just can't happen. And so, a hard look has to be given to who's making the decisions, who has the control. Because clearly it hasn't changed in many, many decades. So my best guess 
is if we can diversify things from the very beginning, but particularly right now in our institutions in our, of higher learning, to get more people at the table that look like me to make some decisions. Otherwise, I'll just keep doing, I'll just keep doing this. There are even calls now to look at the relevance of the study of ethnomusicology. And we all know what ethno means here, right? <laughs> of color. <laughs> Making the very title of the field the study of the other music. Keeping the focus of the lens on Eurocentric music and theory. I, when I was looking at this, and I actually got that, um, that idea that people were looking at the idea of dismantling ethnomusicology, I started Googling, 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 and I came up with a, an amazing um, open letter. It's an ethnomusicologist by the name of Danielle Brown. She resigned from Syracuse University last year, and on June 12th, after her resignation, she wrote an open letter and she posted it online. It's rather long, but I'm going to pull out parts that I think are important. In 2014, I resigned my position. Sorry, it was some, some years ago. Forgive me. In 2014, I resigned my position as an assistant professor of music history and cultures at Syracuse University because of my dissatisfaction with academia in general and ethnomusicology in particular. It is very clear to me that although many white ethnomusicologists understand interpersonal and systematic racism on an intellectual level, they just don't get it. Getting it means understanding that an organization whose predominantly white members by and large research people of color is and can be nothing other than a colonialist and imperialist enterprise. I'll say that again. Getting it means understanding that an organization whose pre predominantly white members by and large research people of color is and can be nothing other than a colonialist and imperialist enterprise, period. It is a hard pill to swallow, but swallow we must. No matter how hard we try to convince ourselves otherwise, until ethnomusicology as a field is dismantled or significantly, significantly restructured so that epistemic violence against BIPOC is not normalized, black lives do not matter. And that's real talk. This means that white members of the society and in the field at large need to come to terms with how they contribute to systemic racism and do something about it. I can assure you that statements, lists of resources, curriculum guides, round tables, panel discussions, and so forth will not put a dent in the system. They might change individual minds and hearts and make people feel better. But I repeat, they will not put a dent in the system. All they will do is redesign the system and create another economy within the system that benefits white people. Does this mean that those who spent decades studying a culture have no right to teach or write in it? Not necessarily. But the changing the system does mean that people of color must be at the forefront of telling their stories until some, of, some sort of equity is reached. Remember, for years, it was fashionable to suggest that BIPOC could not be objective when studying their own cultures. This despite the fact that Western music has been taught in schools predominantly from a Eurocentric perspective, using books written by white people. Changing the system also means that when large numbers of BIPOC are finally put into certain leadership positions, that white people show up. Show up 
listen, learn, without making claims that the organization is deteriorating because you refuse to adjust to something different, or leave in the academic equivalent of white flight. It's also important that white members do not bawl and hint that there are the victims of reverse racism or affirmative action policies. After all, white people have had the beneficiaries of affirmative action since the founding of this nation. Their actions are affirmed. Their voices are affirmed. Their knowledge is affirmed. Their very being is affirmed. Finally, autonomy. If given the opportunity, what would students opt for? I have, like I said, 18 students in my studio at French Warren Players. I can count on one hand how many actually want to play in a symphony orchestra one day. One hand. What do I do with the other 13? What can I offer them? The setup, we're not set up for something else. We can create something else. Patchwork here. Maybe call that professor and ask for a lesson there. You know. We can do all kinds of things, but if we're not set up but something else. I think the powers that control the construct are more afraid of this idea of autonomy than anything. It messes with what really comes down to indoctrination. We started this Ponzi scheme when they were very young, and they have to buy into it. They've invested too much. Their parents have invested too much. By the time they're 17, 18 years old, if you tell them, oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't work out, you destroy them. So we have to give them autonomy, options from the very, very beginning. Questions? Questions? <laughs> Betsy Baumbach. I, I have a question about, you are talking about um, Louisiana and all the, all the culture that was going on there, and then you said when the Civil War came, that destroyed their possibilities of doing that, and I didn't understand what the connection was or the cause and effect. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, I actually skipped a couple of lines because my, my writing wasn't very clear on the page. <laughs> um, I had said that um, there were many people who had the status of freedmen of color. Once the Civil War hit, um, all the laws changed, and there were no more freedmen of color. And so everyone who had this status was now just African American and out of luck. It's hard to, yeah, that, that's hard. You literally would have papers that said you were free and you could walk free and you could study and you could do whatever you want. That was ripped from them. It no longer existed. The laws changed. We took over. Yeah. They didn't become slaves, but they had no rights. They had no, right, had no rights, no special rights. And if you know anything about how the political system worked, even if you had free status, if you were not a slave, you still couldn't do it. You couldn't study. Black people couldn't study. They couldn't, you couldn't marry. You couldn't get a job. You couldn't, <laughs> I mean, it was, it's, it, I know it's, you couldn't own property. That's right. There was, there's, uh, you were basically a slave. Um, all of your rights were taken away um, post the Civil War and, uh, what we called the Reconstruction period. Uh, it, was, um, it was probably worse, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, there are mics. Oh. Carol Conti-Enton. Um, I was thinking of Willie Ruff, 
who you know definitely had one foot in each <laughs> each realm yeah. and uh, during World War II while the army was segregated is when he got his best music education and then when they integrated it all of a sudden he lost opportunity hugely yeah. because of that ratio yeah, yeah. Um, one of the interesting things about the school uh, the natural conservatory that um, Antonin Dvorak taught at um, it was the first of its kind, um, but it opened f fully accepting blacks and women, which was unheard of in the United States. And then you have Antonin Dvorak coming in to the United States, waving his finger at everyone saying, this is what you should be doing. All of you should be doing that. And so the woman who started that, that school, I don't remember her first name, but her last name was Thurber. She was from Paris. She had invested all of her money into this because she really felt passionately about this. She petitioned to the government, to the, to the president of the United States, to make this a national thing and give government funding. She couldn't get a dime. But Juilliard did, because Juilliard wasn't accepting anything but white folks. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it's not written like as such, but it seems very apparent to me. That, that that school was doomed to fail because of the way it started as such a diverse and open um, accepting institution. Um, it's it's worth looking into, National Conservatory of America. It's uh, started in New York City. Yeah. Well, when you were talking about colonization and the way white people, the way we look at things in a certain way, I thought about an article I saw recently about a um, man from Ghana. I don't know who he is. It's, I think he was a and a writer. Anyway, he's going around England discovering uh, rivers and stuff like that. Uh, and <laughs> the same way people go around Africa <laughs> discovering <laughs> things that the I Africans have <laughs> always known were there, but now suddenly they've discovered this river, they've discovered this chasm, they've discovered, you know, and, you know, I thought his, his point was just brilliant. And people are just like, what do you mean? What do you mean? You know, that river's always been there. Yes, we know. Well, you know, much like, and you know, I, I, I can't really get into a, a whole discussion about missionaries, but much like what the Moravians were doing when they came uh, to the New World and they you know, were doing missionaries work with the Indians and helping them to convert to Christianity, teaching them how to play instruments and so forth. Um, but that's where all the very beginning music societies started in the United States. We had no, we don't have the history for classical music. We don't have the Bach and the Beethovens. And so it was brought over literally by the Moravians and then by the Africans, their style of music. But the Moravians were the ones that started all of these coastal, north, uh, sorry, east coastal music societies with really bad composers and really amateur musicians. But then slowly things started to change. Professor Scott, you, you're talking mostly to a white audience here, yes. and you're saying that the problem is that people of color are underrepresented in the institutions. But if we start to think among ourselves of what we can do about the situation, you're essentially telling us that everything we try to do about it is going to be wrong because we're the wrong color. Is that right? I mean, how, how would you have... How would you have people of goodwill who are very interested in music and are, are very interested in what you have to say about how to restructure our system, but how do we as white people uh, do that? What, what, how, what, how do you see our role in this? Excellent question. And the way I see it is almost, almost painfully simple. If you hear what I said, as an attack, then perhaps it's you're not you, but one is perpetuating it. As you, if you see it as an opportunity to have a conversation, then we can have a conversation. I see it as a call. I see it as a call f to action, and I'm wondering uh, what action. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> what action can well, the we action take? is just this: what we're doing right now literally what we're doing right now. Because I think that it's been very easy um, for many, many decades to not confront it. Um, uh, I wouldn't say easy, convenient. 
being it. And it's not anymore. And we all know it. You can feel it bubbling. <laughs> you know, it's not just the music. You know, we've got to confront this. If we're going to move past this, come on, folks. We got, we got to, you know, and people of goodwill want to. But we don't know how to, but you've got to start with a conversation. You know, when it pertains to music, it is so blatant. When 94% of the tenured faculty are Caucasian, that's not a conversation to be had. That's action, <laughs> you know? Sorry, uh, I don't know who's next. This. Yeah, Moravian. Where was Moravia? I don't. I honestly don't. No, no, know. no. I uh, Moravians yeah. came to. Um, well, they're from Europe. They were from Europe. They, but they came. Oh. To, yeah, they came from Europe to escape political persecution. They came as missionaries, and they came with Christianity and tried to help the indigenous folks, particularly in the Carolinas and the Virginias, the Indians, to convert. The, the, the Americans were there, and it was it was a tough fight battle between the the, the native folks and the Americans. And they were kind of trying to do a soft blow. They were trying to help them convert because they saw the initial bloodshed that was going to happen. And so they saw it as an opportunity to use Christianity, music, craftsmanship to find peace. It wasn't all that many decades ago that the Oberlin Conservatory, any professor who wanted to play jazz, went out under cover of darkness <laughs> to meet other such players and do it. <laughs> and now we have a jazz building. Can you comment at all about what progress has been made? Oh, that's progress, man. Well, I'll tell you, there, raise your hand if you know the name William Grant Still. Fantastic. Considered to be the dean of African American composition, he's an African American composer okay. in the in the early 20th century. Lived to around 1978 or so, I want to yeah, say. Many years. Um, wrote what's considered to be one of the greatest American symphonies, the Afro American Symphony, like by an American composer. Had to write uh, arrangements and original compositions in other styles of music, particularly blues and jazz, because he couldn't make money as a classical composer. When he did it, he did it under a pseudonym. His name was Willie M. Grant when he did all the Paul Whiteman arrangements. And he did a ton of them. <laughs> and he did a ton of them. Because he wanted to be considered professional, composer, the highest art. Jazz is low art, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so that's that's kind of where you know where it's been, and you know, I, I mean, you and I can talk about jazz and talk about the way we like it. What does this country think about jazz? What has it ever thought about jazz? You know, it's um, it's better, but certainly can't be taught to classical music students. You know, God forbid they should learn how to swing notes. Um, um, thank you for your talk, and I would love to hear more non-classical music in Oberlin. Um, so I <laughs> hope that'll happen. But what what you said you said you had ideas. You kind of whetted my appetite for what those ideas m might be. I can see changes in curriculum. I could see changes in faculty uh, diversity. Um, you also talked about there not being positions for students graduating in symphony orchestras and so on. I don't know what could be done about that that um, you know relates to more diversity or the, some of the control and there's a problem out there for all kinds of majors graduating and not finding jobs in their field. So can you elaborate on, on what you'd like to see in that area or either curriculum or faculty? Well, um, it's, it's kind of twofold. Um, one, the major symphony orchestras play uh, sort of a shuffle uh, jukebox of, of repertoire. 
you know, and um, and you can guarantee yourself that if you get a subscription, you know, you can pretty much name what you're going to hear in the year, and you wouldn't be too far off without looking at the program, you know. Um, that's part of what has to change. More music by more, but by different people, basically. And I'm not just talking about African American. I'm talking like like everything, you know, mm -hmm. and contemporary music. It has to be. We got to stop playing Brahms. Just got to stop. He's wrote four symphonies. I'm done. I'm done. It's just too much. Every year, the major orchestras play all of the Brahms symphonies all the time. It's just, I mean, what, what are we doing? <laughs> it's just it's too much. And so we have to, you know, and that, that, that in itself is difficult because that's, that's, that's their money. I understand. But if you change it, you get a different constituency in the audience. And that's what's tough to fight, to, 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 to do, because they're worried at the risk of losing that audience but from an, to, for an audience that they, they might get or might not get. That's the tough part. I can't tell them what to do, but I know that's the answer. I know the answer is broadening the lens, broadening the scope of what they offer to have more people interested in what you have to offer. That, to me, sounds like a good business model. The, the bad mis business model, play the same doggone thing that is keeping two-thirds of the population, even more probably, from even considering coming to hear it. Also, we have to go to these Yes. <laughs> yes. I know contemporary thing and hardly anybody signed up. Well, and, and you know what? And to me, and I hear that, but to me, that's okay. Because it should be a breath of, of possibilities. You should be able to look at a, a season. Well, yes and no. I can't make my mother support Brahms symphonies. She hates it, you know? <laughs> but if her son's music is playing, <laughs> ah, she's there. But that's all right. Enough for everyone to consider. That's what we're talking really about is not getting rid of Brahms, but just doesn't have to be all the time. Broaden the lens, broaden it. Accept more things in, and you will see a change in the constituent. You'll see a change. Yes, please. Three things. Oh, sit down. <laughs> First, I hope you will teach your students by example that it is possible to communicate without a microphone if you know how to project your voice. I appreciate the fact that I have heard every word you spoke. Oh, come on. Out. Oh, for heaven's sake. Oh, but you could have done That's it without not, it. I had to you, be you, honest. You could, you could have done it without it, I, right? The gentleman there, he, he mic'd me up. I'm, I thought you were. I would have screamed if I had to, though. OK, so, well, anyhow, yeah, anyhow I could hear. The second thing. <laughs> There will have to be more tenured faculty, and that's expensive. We have over 300 residents at Kendall, and some of them have quite a bit of money. And why doesn't Kendall endow a professorship at the Conservatory of Music to add to the diversity that you were calling for. You're asking me? <laughs> I'm sure there's somebody in this room that can deal with that. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 dean, the dean is here. He'll collect money at the door. Uh, if you just turn a little bit to your right, I'm sure yeah. you can have a great conversation. <laughs> the, third, the third thing, which is a concern not only in terms of music, but religion or almost any other field that you name. Given the global concern that we, we need to respond to in order to be truly educated in the 21st century, trying to fit into a four-year curriculum all of those 
different elements in addition to the elements that we know need to be there, maybe not as highly emphasized as traditionally. How do you do that? Uh, or do we need to extend our college and conservatory education by another year and all the expense involved in order to truly educate our students? Well, um, that's a great question, and I don't know if my answer is popular or not, but um, it goes back to autonomy. Um, I can already tell you right now, two-thirds of my students are not going to be professional horn players. And all they learned while they were here is how to play Mozart and Beethoven. All they learned while they've been here is how to play Mozart and Beethoven. Occasionally, I taught them how to play the blues when we had time. But the bottom line is they have juries. They have requirements. They have auditioning for the music uh, festivals out there. And they all say play the Mozart this and the Strauss that. My responsibility is to prepare them for the things that they have opportunities to do. But autonomy means that if they have the opportunity to study something else, that they do it. And who gives a darn tootin' if they already are not going to get a job in an orchestra when they get outside? Give them the autonomy to choose what they want to do musically. Don't indoctrinate them with 12 composers and tell them that that's the key, that's the ticket. But that is frightening. It's risky. It's frightening and risky for institutions. And I know my dean is probably, he's, yeah, I'm going to have a conversation tomorrow. <laughs> But it's the truth. If you give them the autonomy to choose their own path. I played in a, in a wind quintet. And there was no music for Imani winds. We didn't have music by Brahms and Bailey. We didn't want it anyway. But we didn't have music. We had to create our own. So we went out and we commissioned stuff. And I composed stuff. And the flute player, Valerie Coleman, composed stuff. And we made our own career out of making our own way. We just made where there was no way we made a way. These are Obies. They that's what they that's their DNA. That's what they come here to do. These, these kids change the world. But if you indoctrinate them and say, well, you know, only use two thirds of your brain and the rest we're gonna have you do, these twelve composers, and that's we're not doing a service to them. Let them choose their way. Offer the options. Well, that also means we have to expand what we offer. We'll expand the curriculum. That's but I wouldn't say they have to study it, but it should be a part of the palette. Thank you so much for your talk this evening. I'm curious, you mentioned there were seven positions for French horn, and I assume that's all the orchestra in the United States. What is the number of French horns uh, in, in, in all the orchestra? In, you, that was a combination of all the orchestras, right? Yeah, at that particular time, there were seven jobs listed, Correct. meaning one chair to apply for at that time. Mm -hmm. It fluctuates. Sometimes there's seven, sure. sometimes there's 20, sometimes there's two. You, 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 you know, people don't just leave jobs you know, right away, especially in orchestras. You know? but so I'm at that time, what I'm curious about is how when they're all total? filled, how many there are. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. Every state has a major orchestra. There's usually four horns or five okay. horns in it. Um, then there are smaller orchestras that pay less, and then there's community orchestras that don't pay at all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, you know, thousands, you know, mm -hmm. three, four thousand. I'll, gu I'll guarantee you, there's probably a hundred times more horn players than there are jobs. Mm -hmm. I'll guarantee you that. Yeah. Guaranteed. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. Tom, you, you remembered your question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> He'll make one up even if he did. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's not really a question at this point. It's more of a comment about how things have changed for, in my view, of what I'm hearing these days. I grew up in Chicago listening to WFFT, classical music, you know, and I heard these 12 and all the time. Mm -hmm. But 
in recent times, when I turn on WCLV, I've probably heard Florence Price maybe three or four times. I streamed WFMT, and I've heard Florence Price there, and I've heard, you know, William Grant Still and so on. So I don't think I've heard of those names when I was growing up, and yet today I hear them. You're not that is a good thing, yeah. and I will not, I would never poo poo that. But at the moment, it's just opportunity. At the moment, let's see what happens next year and the year after sure. yeah. and the year after. There are so many other great composers of color, and right now, organizations are capitalizing on the fact that that's what people are doing. Oh, if we play that, they'll listen more, you know. How long will that last? And will, are they really invested? Are they truly invested? Well, I, for my part, I like to hear new things. Amen. <laughs> I, I, no matter what yes. it is. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, that's, thanks so much, Jeff, for a, a stimulating conversation and a great Q&A. Thanks for coming. Thank you all very much. Thank um, you for allowing me in your space. Yeah. So um, just a, a quick reminder on Saturday, as kind of part of this series, the Toni Morrison movie, Pieces of Me. Pieces of Me, is it? The Pieces I Am, I think it's yeah. called. Anyway, um, that movie is Saturday night, and... Um, um, I'll be conducting a little discussion uh, after that. And then on uh, Monday, Renee Romano uh, will be doing the talk that was, was originally scheduled for January called Whistling Dixie and Erasing Blackface. <laughs> oh, I forget. What? Whitewashing, Whitewashing Blackface. So... Um, this is a fascinating talk about her experience in Mount Vernon, Ohio, um, yeah, about a white minstrel player who played in blackface and claims to have written Dixie when in fact it was written by um, a black person in the same town. So fascinating story, come out. Thanks for coming tonight. <laughs>